Hey guys, welcome. Welcome back to Interstage Window, my Saturday stream, which is um, a conversation with my right hand man who is with me today as usual. Say hi, Landon. Hi, Landon. <laughs> I had to change it up a little bit for the topic oh that we're, we're, talk we're having today. <laughs> You're gonna love, you're gonna love my summary. Oh my gosh, I cannot wait. Well, before we get into that, before we kind of switch oh. over to show the presentation, because you know it's a media episode today, tell everybody a little bit about what we're gonna be talking about. The one, the only, the worldwide musical phenomenon, Hamilton, an American musical, or mm -hmm. you know, American propaganda, you choose. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about that. Um, yeah. Sometimes things are two things, right? <laughs> they, you know what? Things can be more than one thing, actually. Yes, two, maybe even three things. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. So we're doing Hamilton, um, and it's very important to remember that Karen and I discovered Hamilton at the same time when Hamilton was in the height in 2012, uh, and Karen learned from it about Tumblr and she learned to loathe it. And I learned about it on Tumblr and I learned to love it. So it is this idea of coming at this situation with two different perspectives uh, and kind of talking about it, which I think is another important thing to add to this conversation is this is the first time on Enter Stage Window that we've really had opposing views on something. Uh, so it'll different be interesting opinions. <laughs> to navigate what that's gonna look like. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, because yes, even, even like right now, our, our, there are things where like Karen says, that I'm just like, I disagree. <laughs> and Karen is going to say things, and uh, Karen's going to sit there and have me say things that she's going to, I know, be thinking like, Landon's so wrong. <laughs> and that's and, okay. And um, it's not that we haven't disagreed before, but this is a little bit different. Um, this is a little bit different. Yeah. So, okay. So here I we go. Now you should be able to hear us when we're on this screen. I apologize mm -hmm. for that, you guys, but there we go. It's all fixed. <laughs> Uh, I think it's that important just information as far as that this is the first time we're going to be having a live topic debate sort of thing, although we know mostly what's going to be said. So well, it's not yeah. that yeah. spicy. It just <laughs> might be a little spicy. Mm -hmm. A little spicier than what we're probably used to. Okay. <laughs> All right. Hamilton, the American musical. Uh, however, as we do with the Enter Stage Window, we should start at the first place, which is favorite things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, okay. And as you guys know, <laughs> okay, no one is surprised to see this image pop up. <laughs> if you are surprised, hello, welcome. Um, we're gonna we're gonna be great friends, you and I. Um, I promise. Like I'm cool. Okay. <laughs> if you know me. You're not surprised. Of course, this is a very spoiler free. Um, this is not this is not a spoiler oh, yeah. free situation. We do we it's going to be all spoilers. So if you've never seen Hamilton before, um, strap in, get ready, because uh, we're going to spoil everything. So my favorite part of Hamilton, and this was true when I listened to the musical when it first came out. This was true um, with everything that I experienced and saw on Tumblr. This is, is was true when the Disney Plus version came out and I actually watched the performance. It I is probably was more true after you watched the wonderful thing that is, you know. Oh, Landon. <laughs> oh, Landon. <laughs> I love the portrayal of King George in this musical. He is fantastic. I think they just they just do a perfect job, like lyrically, musically, the way that it's staged, the way that it's acted. I just think he is amazing. And no one needs to point out to me that yes, Karen, like other um, men you become interested in in media, he is incredibly problematic, super dramatic, and has an absolutely maniacal laugh. I know. Okay, I have a type. I'm just saying. I love problematic men and i do not want them to get better just stay exactly exactly how you are and he did only get better so so he comes on so the way that that uh that king george is portrayed in this musical he comes on kind of all by himself and he gives these asides to kind of explain what his perspective is from various things that are going on in uh in the america in america during um the revolutionary war times right um and so he he kind of gets to come on all by himself. And something I, I didn't know until I saw the Disney Plus version of this musical where you get uh, extreme close-ups of his face, he can't stop fucking drooling. 
And it only made him look crazier. And you know that just my heart said doki doki. And I just could not, I could not be contained. And so my favorite thing is King George in this we, musical. We love the Groff and his <laughs> spit all over the first three <laughs> rows of the Broadway. I had no idea. Audience. I had no idea. I had no idea he drooled so much, you guys, like really, truly. And then I saw it and I was like, what is wrong with him? Is he okay? And then like ever all three songs, he has three songs where he comes on. I'm like, he's doing it in all three songs. And I'm like, Oh my God, is he okay? And I'm, I'm like Googling it. And of course I can, you can easily find an interview where somebody made fun of his spitting. And he was like, you know, it's just, I just do that when I sing. It's just who I am. <laughs> and I just, happens. I'm like, but it was it not was... a character choice. It's just, it's just how he is. <laughs> um, I also think there's a beautiful, a beautiful moment of just King George based off the British invasion of the Beatles in the writing that's what all of his songs are based off of that's the vibe of the musical is that it's like the British invasion and the idea of the Beatles and and that up punk sort of sound so it just I love that too and his music is fantastic (laughs) oh yeah I just and I I love I love all of his songs like I I sometimes I'm like oh the first one's my favorite and then sometimes like oh no 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 the last one about John Adams is my favorite um or oh no no it's the it's the line where he's like Awesome. Wow. Um, yes, like I, just... wow. I love how he like also stays on afterwards. He's like, mm-hmm. I am a petty bitch, but I am going to watch this drama. Oh my God. I love that part where, and he's like, where he gets the stool and he's just like sitting cross-legged, like, what's up guys? <laughs> never going to be president. <laughs> he's so good. He's so good. So, so he's this good. is my favorite thing about Hamilton. Um, I could watch just those three scenes over and over on repeat and just, and be like the happiest little Karen. <laughs> it's definitely King George is up there. Uh, mm-hmm. and it's, it's wonderful. It's fantastic. Mm-hmm. So, so Landon, what is your favorite thing in Hamilton? <laughs> you ask, well, as Karen likes problematic men, I also like problematic men, but of a certain different kind. You see, Karen likes the evil, overpowering ones. And I like the ones that I could fix, that are good at heart, who really, truly just have the best of intentions, like Aaron Burr, sir, who's just misunderstood, even though he murdered several people. Misunderstood! <laughs> He didn't want to murder them. It wasn't his fault. It wasn't his fault. And you know what? If Leslie Odom Jr. continues to play him, I will believe anything Burr goddamn says. <laughs> uh, That's no. the other song I could listen to on repeat, though. The Room Where It Happens. Oh, my God. Happens, Genius. For me, Wait For It is probably the single most impactful song I have ever heard in a Broadway musical. Um, Wait For It, for me, like, touched a piece of my soul in a way that like I felt understood in in a song for the first time Mm -hmm. um because it has always I've always kind of felt that similar way with Burr as far as being like yeah I see other people around me who are willing to act and take what they want but I'm gonna sit here and wait for that that moment um and sometimes that moment passes you by and it was a moment it was just a song that I really just understood maybe as like an artist Uh, Because a lot of my like artsy friends also get it. And I'm just like, yeah, that song. (laughs) Um, So his whole story arc, the way that he's written, the way that he's portrayed, and also his, his songs are just out of this, out of this atmosphere. It's fantastic. Uh, And I will watch and believe Aaron Burr every day for the rest of my life. (laughs) Uh, Leslie Odom Jr. (laughs) is truly talented he's truly talented like i mean i hope i wish i could be leslie odom jr when i grew up like he is amazing no and he's just incredible like as a human being watching interviews after and he's just incredibly humble too Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh, and very kind and just forward with best of intentions uh it's it's amazing i love oh my gosh Thank you so much, Kay, for your for your prime. I love it when Jeff Bezos when you make Jeff Bezos spend his money on me. Thank you so much. (laughs) (laughs) Hi. (laughs) Um, But yeah, I would say. I mean, I think we're we're pretty aligned on on our favorite things in this musical. I would say that um, Aaron Burr is a close close second to King George for favorite character for me. He is outstanding, outstanding. I think we didn't even need to have a conversation. We were like, our two favorite things are King George and Aaron Burr. You take King George, I'll take Aaron Burr. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> we just picked which one was most on brand for each of us. 
but also Burr beats Burr beats George for me. But that's okay. Mm. That's okay. I mean, you know, you know how it is. It's kind of like I think it's like I'm like this, and you're like this. Like it's you know. Yeah. I'm but just yeah, a- mm-hmm. active fangirl. <laughs> He's so uh, good. He's so good. And then, and then of course we have this epic moment with the two hotties together. <laughs> just gotta just love that. And look uh, at look at their beautiful smiles. Like like, like just look at how happy they are in this ecstatic. scene. <laughs> they're ecstatic to share the stage together. They're also so happy to watch Alexander Hamilton ruin his own fucking life, which is what's happening in this scene. Mm-hmm. Like that's so. what the scene is transitioning into is a scene where Alexander Hamilton's about to like you know, drop have him. a bad time. Yeah, we'll talk about it in the summary, but drop his uh, drop his own uh just yeah, just destroy his own life because he it's a Wednesday and that's what he feels like doing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Kay. I appreciate it. You are welcome to lurk. Um, mobile is valid. I totally understand. I'm on mobile right now, except like not here, but like here. So <laughs> Landon <laughs> loves it, loves uh, us so much. She's here twice. <laughs> you can't get rid of me. I'm like Aaron Burr. <laughs> yeah, I just keep popping up in your story. <laughs> But we All love right. it. We love it. Um, we love these two characters, and um, and they are they are shining gems in a musical with um, with a lot of talent in it. So you know, on, on one hand, it's hard to pick, but on another hand, it's very easy for us to yeah. pick. I think. No, I'm so goddamn glad that uh, <laughs> that that uh, Leslie got the Tony for best lead actor because he Deserved. is the lead actor. Whether people believe that or not, Burr is the main character of this. Uh, it might be named after Alexander Hamilton, but Burr is the main character. Um, <laughs> and yeah, it's it's just interesting. So it's mm-hmm, fantastic. Mm-hmm. But as we must, shall we move on to what this is actually about? Yes. Okay. We've done enough fluff and intro and things <sighs> like that. Let's talk about it. So as we like to start with these, Landon is going to give us a plot summary. So for those of you that haven't seen Hamilton or the last time you watched it was when it was very, it had very first come out, you can be reminded of the, the basic outline and events. So Landon, take it away. What happens in Hamilton? I- I have to preface this and maybe even ask forgiveness because when I was charged with writing this, I had a brilliant idea. And then I got about halfway through and I realized that it was a mistake, but I was already committed. So uh, this might be a little longer than normal, but it's worth it. I promise. Alexander Hamilton is a young boy sent from the Caribbean to New York City to have a better life because the people on the islands saw how talented he was at writing. He attends college where he meets Aaron Burr, sir. He laments to Burr about how, who is much more reserved and callous than Hamilton, that he won't throw away his shot for fame and importance in the American legacy. Lafayette, Mulligan, and Lawrence, all soon to be famous men from the USA's Revolutionary War, speak of the story of tonight to refute farmers and deny the British the ownership of the land of the free, even if King George is convinced that we'll be back. Hamilton is quickly named Washington's right-hand man, crossing paths with Burr once more, accepting that history has its eyes on him as he skillfully navigates through the stealing of cannons, the blasts of guns and ships. All the while, he meets the Schuyler sisters, rich heiresses whose father is an important political figurehead. The eldest, Angelica, decides that she would be satisfied with a man with having a man for her equal as a husband, but ultimately feels that her sister is helpless in her emotion for Hamilton and sets them up instead at a winter's ball during the war. They are married shortly after. It is told to Hamilton it would be en- that it would be enough if he simply stayed alive. But after learning the Ten Dual Commandments and the Battle of Yorktown in the Revolutionary, the Revolutionary War is won. And what comes next for Hamilton and Burr? Burr, who has spent all this time waiting for it, has to, uh, for his dear Theodosia, is now a parent alongside Hamilton. They both come out of the war better men than they started, and they become lawyers, and Hamilton climbs the political ladder at a nonstop pace. He once again tells the, uh, the place beside, or takes his place beside Washington as Secretary of Treasurer. Enter the villain of the story. As Thomas Jefferson asks what he has missed during the years that he has spent in France, he becomes an, advers- an adversary for the new money Hamilton. As they argue over several cabinet battles, Angelica and Eliza try to convince Hamilton to take a break from his political duties, but instead he says no to that, and he starts an affair with one Mariah Reynolds. Upon Hamilton's success, 
Burr, who has woven in and out of Hamilton's life thus far, wants to be in the room where it happens and successfully now become senator of New York State, beating out uh, Schuyler defeated. Even though Washington is on his side, it cannot, um, it cannot stop Han enemies coming for Hamilton. But none is worse than the hurricane himself, as he drops the Reynolds pamphlet and publicly announces his own affair after proving that he did not use illegal funds to hide it. He runs, he ruins any chance that he can get at being president. Twelve years later, in walks Philip Hamilton, Alexander's <gasps> eldest son, blowing us all away with his swag and charm. But minutes after meeting him, he is killed in a duel that will later hint at Hamilton's own demise. Hamilton takes a step back from politics, moving up to the quiet uptown, as Burr openly campaigns in the election of 1800 against Thomas Jefferson for president. When Hamilton, who is bothered by his party, tells them to vote for Thomas Jefferson instead of his longtime friend and rival Burr, Burr is confused and hurt and ch challenges Hamilton to a duel where he kills the man, discovering in that moment where Hamilton threw away his shot, but Byrd did not wait for it, that the world would have been wide enough for the both of them. In the final eulogy to Alexander, the, prayer, the players ask the haunting question, who lives, who dies, and who tells your story? As we discover naturally, all the men in the story are terrible, and Eliza Hamilton was the true hero after all. And that is all 54 songs from Hamilton. Oh my <laughs> God. Oh my God. Landon, how? Listen. I can't, I, I can't believe it. Thank Listen. you. Thank you for that summary. Thank you. Thank you. I thank you for dealing with it. I'm sorry if it wasn't the most enlightening, but like I needed to just throw every single title in there. <laughs> that was perfect. That was beautiful. Um, I didn't even it was so interwoven that I didn't realize quite that's what you were doing at first. And then like maybe, um, you know, a quarter of the way through, I was like, oh, and then it just kept going and kept going and kept going. And I was like, wow. <laughs> Really? <laughs> yeah. I so I know that must have taken you longer than the uh the summaries normally do. So I'll tell you, I appreciate very it. Very satisfying. So thank you. <laughs> oh, it was so good. That was so good. So so yes, um, you know, Hamilton is historical fiction, right? Mm -hmm. So um for for the things that Landon said, she was summarizing what happens in the play and um and some of that happened in real life, you know. Yes. It is it is a historical fiction. So a lot of that stuff you might remember like, oh, I, you know, I kind of learned about that in history class, right? So Bird, um, so that, yeah. Aaron Bird did in fact shoot Alexander Hamilton. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thomas Jefferson did in fact help write the Declaration of Independence. Yeah. And he did spend a lot of time in France away from everybody. And people were mad about that. <laughs> However, the important part of historical fiction is the fiction part, yeah. which is what a lot of people lost when this play came out. So to give you a little bit of background, Karen, would you be willing to tell us a little bit about the history itself? Yes, okay, so let's talk about it. Let's talk about what actually happened. I chose this line to exemplify what I want to explain here, where, um, where there's this line where uh, Burr says, Martha Washington named her feral tomcat after him. And, you know, Lin-Manuel Miranda comes in, you know, as, as, as Hamilton, but not really. He's speaking to the audience directly. That's true. Guys, it's not true. There's no evidence that that happened. <laughs> the one thing in the musical that they say this is true, there is no evidence that that is true. I mean, maybe it is, but, but it, that's just, it. as far as we can tell, looking into this, Lin-Manuel Miranda, Manuel Miranda made that up. <laughs> No, it's actually very funny. So and um, Lin-Manuel Miranda wrote a book after Hamilton called Hamilton <laughs> the Revolution, which has all of the lyrics and all of his thoughts and breakdowns of all of his lyrics in it. And when you get to that line in the play, it's like highlighted. And it's like this exchange of that's true. And then it's, and then it's Lin-Manuel Miranda being like, actually, it's not true. Hamilton mm -hmm. just wanted everyone to think that. Yep. <laughs> He just he just lied. <laughs> he just lied. <laughs> yep. So so I think this exemplifies like how I feel about the the truth of this musical. I don't really care about these details. I think they're kind of funny, right? Like the cat thing isn't true. 
Um, I'll, I'll list a couple of other things. There were tons of Skylar kids. They had like 15 of them things. There wasn't just three girls. Okay. Um, it's not true, but it, it makes, it makes an interesting story if these are like, you know, just three girls and there's no boys. And so there's like this pressure on, on the girls, right? Um, several of the battles featured in the musical are rearranged. Like events will be taken from battles and moved to other battles or, or battles will be combined where in reality it was multiple battles, but they just say it was one in the musical, um, uh, another thing, Jefferson didn't run for president in 1776, um, that in during at that time, it's just so many people wrote him in that it's kind of like he ran, but he didn't really, he didn't really run for president until, until later. Um, and, but all of these details, all of these little details you can find in other breakdowns of Hamilton on YouTube. Okay. There's lots of people that when this came out, as 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 you like to do with historical fiction, well, do do like little cinema sins type of episodes of like wrong, 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 wrong. Okay, so that exists already. So I'm not really super interested in talking about all of those little details. I don't care about that. I care about the overall. So here's what I mean by that. I'm gonna paint this picture for you guys. Our country was not at this time, and has not been for you know, until, except for the beginning of human history, young, scrappy, or hungry. It's, it, it's not true. The entire thesis of this musical is not true. I mean, okay, like maybe we're hungry. I know there was accusations of cannibalism during, you know, colonial times because all the, the settlers didn't know how to grow food. They were hungry. Okay, so maybe that part's true. But we're not young and scrappy, okay? I can only imagine what it must have felt like to be an indigenous person on this land when this musical got super popular and how that must have felt. I can only imagine because it is more mythologizing. Okay. I'll give another example. Our revolution, the American revolution was not a revolution. I know we call it that because we kicked out England. Okay. But it was not a revolution in any sense of the word. I'm going to use an analogy. Imagine that America is a business. This should not be hard to do. We started out as a business with the Virginia Company and, and others, and we established, came here and established company towns, right? So it should not be hard. So imagine America is a business. What we did when we kicked out the British was the board basically voted out the British CEO and put in a new American CEO. The board didn't change, okay? So if Facebook tomorrow was to say, hey, we don't like this direction, Meta is stupid, and they somehow bought enough stock to kick out Mark Zuckerberg and they put someone else in, would that be a Facebook revolution? No, it would not be. All of the leadership is still the same. The only changed the guy on top. That's it. So the American Revolution was not a revolution. And I, I explain all that so that you can understand that there was never any hope of Karen Terry liking Hamilton. I can't like historical fiction about the Founding Fathers because we keep doing this. And it frustrates me so much. And this is part of where I want to be hopeful for us, and then I feel that hope in my heart. I believe our country can be the shining city on the hill that we profess to be and that we want to be. I believe there's elements of our democracy that are incredibly well-crafted to service the people. However, when we mythologize and deny our history, our real history, the further we move away from that as a possibility. And so when I see something like Hamilton getting popular, where its thesis statement is simply wrong and the morals that it pushes are simply wrong and not how it was, it just really kills that hope that I have inside of me. And I watched Tumblr do this. I watched Tumblr elevate this and talk about, you know, 
Miku Binder Jefferson memes and all of these things. And I just was like, you people are dumb. And then it grew from there. And history teachers were taking their classes to see Hamilton <laughs> as if it had anything to do with history. It doesn't. It features characters of the same name that do basically the same things, but it is not our history at all in any shape or form. And so, you know, there is no, to me, better version of Hamilton that could be possible. It doesn't exist because I just simply cannot handle historical fiction about this. So that being said, now you know a little bit of the overall of what actual ha actually happened. Uh, we do have a couple things we want to break down about that. But before we do, um, Landon, I've ranted for, for a second. <laughs> Is there anything you wanted to say about the overall before we get into those couple of specific points that we wanted to make? No, I think I think the specific points uh points wrap up a lot of what I want to talk about. I think the important thing is is that like this is a problem <laughs> that was all over. It wasn't just Tumblr. It wasn't just musical fan the like fans that musical theater fans that were taking over and being like, "Oh my god, this is a history lesson." Like it was marketed that way and we're going to talk about that but not only was it marketed that way but news outlets talked about it that way um there was it was this explosion of expecting Hamilton to be true to mm -hmm. have a to have this history a fun way of telling history like it was a YouTube video and that's that was never the point of it um and I think that that's I think that this is just an example of something that is supposed to be niche that got mainstream and none of the, like, none of it was actually taken into context. Mm -hmm. um, no, you're right. It was treated like a crash course YouTube video that you would show in uh, class and then break down the video. That's exactly how it was treated. And and then even then critique, like people who, who came in to see it and then critiqued it and didn't like it real, like understandably so, and then expected Lin-Manuel Miranda to be a historian. He's never been a historian. He's never claimed to be a historian. He never wants to be a historian. He's a artist. And that is something that we're going to get into and talk about. But I think that that's an important aspect of all of this, that like, if we're going to, if it's historical fiction, it needs to be regarded as historical fiction by everybody, including the critics um, of this, that it's like, this was never supposed to be real. It was never supposed to be advertised as real. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but so many people thought it was so, so many, many people, people did was. everybody thought it was like and that is in the, and we'll talk about whose fault that is in a second but yeah that's an important aspect of all of this yeah. um yeah. that that this <laughs> this isn't real mm -hmm. and just like rent isn't real it talked about real things that were happening in the 90s but it wasn't a real story mm -hmm. um in hamilton the same way this is talked about real things that were happening and use names and figureheads, but they're fucking singing hip hop. <laughs> like they're singing hip hop. And there are people of color who are white, who are actually white people in real life. Like there is obviously supposed to be a separation between what happened and what didn't happen yeah. that didn't end with the musicality and didn't end with the uh, casting. Yeah, And that's something that's incredibly important that the nuance was lost in. Yep. I mean, even the Hamilton was an immigrant, like that part is true. But to pretend like he was considered a person of color at that time, he was not. He was yeah, considered he... white at that time. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So um, let's get into these like really specific things that we wanted to talk about, though. Yep. OK, so. In Hamilton. Oops, sorry. Oh, you OK, you're good. Yep, so one, go. one more click, I think. So in <laughs> Hamilton, um, it's it, they act like that Alexander Hamilton was the founding father of the people. And here's the thing. I feel like the reason that they were able to decide that he was was because Alexander Hamilton was one of the few founding fathers that we don't talk a lot about. Like we don't learn a lot about him in school. And so everyone was able to buy like, oh, he was the one that cared about the people. So I just want to make something clear here. All of the founding fathers, all of them were annoying ass rich dudes. 
All of them. Not a All single the... one cared about average people. Not a single one. Um, the society wasn't built to care about, I mean, it's still not, but even more so back then, to care about people who were not of the upper echelon of society, mm-hmm. who were not well-educated, who were not ca- coming from money, who were not um, considered of, of good blood and good stock. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, they, it wasn't meant to consider them because they didn't matter. Uh, they were, they were, I, I mean, we were so similar to the way, to the way that English, that English like hierarchy was, was back then too. Like people, I think consider there was a huge difference, but back in, back at the beginning of the United States, like the country itself and not obviously the people who were living there, there was this expectation of class and social structure that was incredibly similar to the European social structure because we came from that, because the society was inspired off of that and keep and kept that forever. (laughs) Yeah, because we were European in the beginning. You know, we hadn't established an American identity that didn't exist yet. You know, this this idea of um, of European settlers in America, they didn't have their own identity for the beginning of it. And And, wouldn't um, wouldn't continue to exist for 150 years later yeah like that's the other thing too is that we again that that whole idea of this wasn't a revolutionary we just changed who was in charge because nothing actually like happened from there Mm -hmm. the you know there were still slaves there were still a lower class that was the working merchant class and until it became a place for immigrants to really come and the class structure had to change here and the middle in a middle class was born with the freeing of slaves as well as the immigrants coming over and working as laborers like until that happened it still kept the same class structure Mm -hmm. yep yeah we changed our class structure at pretty much the same time that um that england did because of the industrial revolution like we 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 weren't and continue not to be really any different in that regard and so the ability to pretend that uh, that Hamilton was was somehow this founding father of the people, I think is the, the biggest sin of this particular musical because there was no such thing. They None of them were looking out for the average person. None of no. them. But then again, the reasoning behind this decision is that you have to have a protagonist that is likable. Yeah. You have to have a protagonist that is understandable, that you get the audience to root for, because if you hate the protagonist, you're going to hate the story. True. So but the thing is, needed... is there's, there's a reason. There's a reason yeah. that um, Hamilton, we don't learn about him much, that pretty much the only thing you learn in school about him is that he got shot. Nobody um, liked him. He got nobody. shot nobody liked him. <laughs> nobody liked him. And I do think the musical does a good job of conveying some of the reasons that people don't like him, but it does that while stripping the reasons away from it that the audience also would not like him. You wouldn't like him either if you lived then. You wouldn't. None of us would, you know? I mean, unless you're some kind of like, um, I don't know, like really traditional, super traditional person. And in which case, I don't know how you stumbled upon, you know, my channel, (laughs) but (laughs) you wouldn't have liked him either. Doesn't make too much sense. Um, (laughs) But yeah, no, it's, it's that whole thing of he is, he he was, he was the character of Hamilton was created. The story of him is pretty true to fact as far as like the things that happened when we come to he was important he was sent from the Caribbean to NYC he was made Washington's personal writer and secretary he was made secretary of treasurer he was important to the establishment of a lot of our financial situation he did release the rep like the actual facts of everything that Hamilton goes through is fairly true the reasoning why he did those things and the character of him is all made up to suit the story that is told. Yep. To yep. to make it an interesting story rather than a retelling of events. Mm-hmm. There is a difference between those two things. Yep. Um, so yep. the character it's not, a, it's not a history book, it's entertainment. <laughs> yes. The character is made up. And it is the character that we fall in love with. And because we equate that character to its actions, we think we know Hamilton and his and his base of his actions. When yeah. the reality is, is that we don't know anything about Hamilton. We just know the things that he did do. And we know we do the things that we know about Hamilton. It's well. So the truth is, is compared to other founding fathers, we actually know quite a lot about Hamilton because he never stopped writing. That part is true. He was prolific. <laughs> Okay, he was prolific. Every opinion he ever had, 
is on paper. Um, he he never stopped. That part is true. He never stopped writing ever. Um, you so need people to read his shit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Yes. So there's another reason, though, that um, that people well, really didn't like Hamilton. That, that people didn't like Hamilton. It's not just the stuff that we're that we're talking about. Um, so Landon, if we could put up yep. pull up the next screenshot. Yeah. Guess what? Land uh, Hamilton. Um, he didn't like democracy. He didn't even. He wasn't. He was like the annoying conservative of the friend group. Okay. He was like, why can't we have aristocracy here? Like, why can't we establish? Um, like a, a and a, you know, a, somebody like that actually is like that's how we we um divvy out land here is through like an, an aristocracy. Yeah. Why should we give power to the uneducated masses? Yeah. Why should we do that when us educated people really understand what's going on mm-hmm. and how to run a country? And that's mm-hmm. kind of like it was that that higher than thou educational sort of. It's not just education. You have to be, you have to be educated and have money. Yes, and um, well, and that's what I mean, he, that's how he felt. But like, let's also be honest. Education did equal money back then. People oh, yeah. were not educated and poor, mm-hmm. unless you were unless you were the Hamiltons of the world. And Hamilton was one in a very few. And even then, yeah. he was not poor. No, but he, his was a he rare was New story. York poor, but he wasn't poor in the grand scheme of things. <laughs> right. So, yeah. So in a, so if you can kind of see now, if, if it didn't really make much sense in the musical, why everyone was so hating on Hamilton, it's like, he's only a little annoying. Like, I don't get it. Well, it's because, like, he really didn't even have the same ideals as all of the other founding fathers. Like, he didn't even believe in democracy. Like, he literally yeah. was so far, he was so far to the right. Like, it was ridiculous. He wanted a constitutional monarchy. So at that time... Um, England had a constitutional monarchy, right? So like George, King George had some power, but not really, right? So like when King George comes on and in, in his second song and he has the, the opening line that's about how they think they won't let me keep spending money on, on my war. The they he's talking about are his ministers because they had a constitutional monarchy where George really didn't make the decisions. He was more of a figurehead that they that they venerated and respected. Um, and then of course the, the monarchy's power has been slowly stripped more and more over the years until we're, we're at today, the constitutional monarchy of today. But but even then, they they still had a constitutional monarchy where they had, they had this figure, figurehead king, and, but it was really the ministers that had the power, and they were the various members of the rich aristocracy. And that's what Hamilton wanted for us. He wanted us to have that. He wanted us to have yeah. King, probably King George Washington would have been his his pick ultimately, but it wasn't he wasn't consistent in that. And um and then you know him and his buddies would all be members of the aristocracy. And there are lines about this hidden in the musical. There are things like in the song Nonstop, there's a line about how he was invited to the to speak at the constitutional um uh, gathering I can't remember the name of it and he talked for six hours like and that's a true story he spoke about a monarchy a constitutional monarchy for six hours trying to debate people into thinking that this was the right idea to run the constitution under a monarchy uh, and then also there is in the line in um, one last time where he is basically begging Washington to continue on his reign and that no one would actually win against a against uh washington in a in a um election and so he could yeah. continue to serve and it's his duty to serve almost like a king's duty is to conserve uh continue to serve and so it's it, it there are hints of it but yeah no he was very pro monarchy pro king he wanted he wanted the same thing like he was never fighting to break the system he just, no, he just wanted, wanted to be part of it <laughs> <laughs> he wanted to be part of it. And yes, there is this idea that war was the best. I mean, this is a true, this is a true fact. Amongst the aristocracy, war is the best way to gain recognition because the people who are serving or and dying are then leaving vacancies, for lack of a better word, mm-hmm. to slip into their spots. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And so Hamilton knew that if they went to war, he was going to be able to climb the social ladder, he was going to be able to get a spot. And then he could serve and it can benefit him rather than being on the outside looking in. Exactly. Exactly. Welcome in, Mr. Tiny Corndog. So happy to have you here. Hope you um, stay and stick around. We're talking about Hamilton today. Um, But yes, Hamilton did not want to change the system. He didn't want to make a better system. He thought the system was just fine and hunky dory. All he wanted was for the system to include him. That's it. And so... 
this is why none of the other founding fathers really liked him. This is why he had such frustrations and, and such contention, um, particularly with uh, with Jefferson and, and the other Southerners. Um, you know, there was still a lot of anim animosity between the, the South and the, the New York style Northeast, <laughs> even then. And... Um, and so, so you know, there's 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 a reason no one liked him. It wasn't just because he was an annoying and a workhorse and um, didn't know how to shut up. It was literally his ideals. His ideals did not align with those of his buddies. And then he got what he wanted, like yeah. in a way. And it wasn't the constitutional monarchy, but he was able to gain power within the service by knowing the right people, doing the right things, being very prolific and clever as he was. He was able to garner a spot where he created the financial plan of, of our country. Yeah. And was so, able to then take this overarching position that gave him a lot of influence and power and money. So let's talk about that. This is actually one of the parts of the musical where I think they do a really, really yes. good job in explaining kind of what actually happened. Um, Landon, if we, could, if we could show the screenshot. Yep. Um, so, so I want to explain a little bit more, a little bit more dry way what he did for the economy so that this makes sense for, for anybody that missed it in the musical. Um, basically what he did was he federalized our currency. This was really good in the long run. Okay. So do not get me wrong. What Hamilton did was genius and it was right. Okay. It was, but I can only say that because I have the high insight of knowing what happened after. Hamilton doesn't know this. So what I'm about to share with you about why I think he was right, he couldn't have known this and he didn't make the decision based off of this. I'll tell you why in a minute why, why, why he made the decision. So let's think about the euro. So whenever the EU created the euro, they chose to not federalize their currency. So we all know what happened then. And oh, thank you so much for the follow, Mr. Tiny Corn Dog. Let's talk. Let's, I hope you like finance. That's what we're, gonna, we're talking about for a second. So <laughs> what happened? What happened at that point was certain countries in the European Union really had trouble. Greece in particular was in the news for having a lot of trouble, a lot of debt. But because they never federalized the euro because they wanted all of the members of the EU to be more autonomous. They didn't do that. And so what that meant is that richer countries like the UK, like France, etc., were able to say, I don't want to pay Greece's debt. They are on their own. OK, they said that's that's what happened. Right. Like if you're old enough, you remember when that was going on. Um, and so I'm very glad that Hamilton did that because what that means is we have the, the the federal government now has the ability when a state is poorer to lift them up. And as we know, historically, the South ended up quite poor. At the time, they were not. At the time, they were not the poor states. But once we got rid of slavery, they were. And as somebody that has lived in the Southeast, I'm very glad for that. The Southeast would be even worse than it is today economically if it were not for that. So thank you, Hamilton. Now, Hamilton didn't know any of that shit. That's not why he did it, okay? He did it to get rich, okay? So here's how. During the Revolutionary War, we were poor. The U.S. was very, very poor. We didn't have no money at all. So the government... <laughs> paid their soldiers and their other war fighters, like, and when I say war fighter, I mean like, you know, the nurses and the people that were, you know, building the guns and the, you know, all the people that it takes to make a war happen. They were paying them in IOUs, basically. They were saying, thank you so much for fighting for us. Here you go. Here's an IOU. We'll, we'll pay you tomorrow, sir. Thank you so much for your service. And there was a lot of debate over whether the government could and should make good on those IOUs. I mean, there were some people that legitimately thought like, well, you know, we don't have any money still. And we're so we're just not going to pay those people. That was a legitimate um, the argument that people had at that time. Well, Hamilton, what he did, because people would have these IOUs, right? They would have these IOUs that says the government owes you 100, 100 bucks. Okay. You think this government's never paying this crap. This is a useless piece of paper. Hamilton says, well, sir, maybe you will never get your hundred bucks, but I will be more than happy to purchase that piece of paper 50. Well, if you really think you're never going to see that hundred, wouldn't you take it? Of course you would. And so Hamilton bought a bunch of these IOUs 
for cheap. Okay. So he has all of them. He has a huge stack of these IOUs. So isn't it quite beneficial to Hamilton if we actually pay off our debts? This is like the, this is like the definition of early insider trading. Yes. (laughs) Like this is, yeah, he, he was the inside man. He's like, yeah, I can convince them to pay off our debts. Therefore, uh, I will make a shit ton of fucking money and it'll be legal. Yeah, he wasn't doing it because he thought federalizing the currency was a good idea or he had the foresight to know that that was the right thing to do. He was doing it to get rich. That's it. That's why he was doing it. He he wanted which, to get mo money. Which I am so sad is not in the musical because I feel like that is the American ideology. <laughs> Build an entire financial system so that you yourself can be rich mm-hmm. and fuck over the people who fought in a war. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the American tradition. So, you know, why why is our capital in Washington DC and Wall Street in New York City? Well, we can thank Alexander Hamilton. 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 That's right. Uh, but also that means we got a great fucking song room where it happens out of it. So <laughs> Oh my God. Oh my God. So good, right? Uh, fuck all the people who were screwed over back in the 1700s. We got the room where it happens in 2012, and that should make everybody happy. I think we got the better end of the deal. <laughs> Honestly, dead. <laughs> so yes. Um, okay, so this this portrait that we're painting here, this is the real Hamilton. Now imagine if Lin-Manuel Miranda had wrote this Hamilton. Do you think Hamilton would have gotten popular? No, no one would have given given two fucks. The same reason that Hamilton was not popular as one of the founding fathers you learn about in school um, up until this point. No one cared because this is who he was. He was a money hungry monarchist. Yes, he fucking was. Uh, And I think that brings us also to the real, the real miss done and misjustice on Hamilton's character. The real thing that Lin-Manuel Miranda changed over everything in order to get us to really like this man, to really make 2012 audiences feel like we could be on his side of things. Um, And this is where LMM did us real dirty. Yeah. Uh, And that is that every single fucking founding father was pro-slavery. Yep. Every single one of them. Hamilton is painted as this abolitionist who really just didn't get to it, didn't get to fighting slavery, but it was on his list of things to do. And if he had lived longer, he would have gotten there. It's not true. Not true. It's not true. Uh, (laughs) Remember how I said Hamilton was incredibly prolific? And the the musical says this too, and this part is true. He wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote. If he was an abolitionist, guess what? He would have wrote about it, but he didn't. Okay, (sighs) abolition was an idea that came about in the next generation. Hamilton did not care about abolition. He did not. And neither did any of his friends. I thought thought Lawrence did. I mean, he might have a little bit, but... um, But but, even it wasn't to the the effect of like... Like, yes, Lawrence created the first Black Battalion, but that was that was it. That's what happened. Yeah. And it yeah. wasn't because Hamilton didn't go anywhere with that. It was because Hamilton was neutral to it, at the very best neutral to it. Yeah. For the best we can tell, based on everything that Hamilton wrote, if he felt anything in regards to slavery, it was that he felt nothing. He grew up in a house where there were slaves. Mm-hmm. His family owned slaves in the Caribbean. They made his, his father was a slave trader. Like yeah. that's how he made his money in the Caribbean. Mm-hmm. That's the wealth that he came from and the wealth of the community that sent him to America. Yep. Where and remember it, Hamilton's favorite thing is money. It's his favorite thing. And then he joined a war that wasn't about slavery. He wasn't going to piss people off about slavery because his entire purpose was him to garner himself popular so that he could make enough money to be at the status that he wanted to be, to be at the secure level that he wanted to be. And being anti-slavery, being an abolitionist, A, you're right, didn't exist until the next generation. But even at that point, the people who were kind of in that way were very, very much looked down upon. Yeah. Yeah, because the only people that really felt that way 
at the time were the slaves themselves. Yeah. Or, so. or, or those who didn't, or those who couldn't afford slaves. Mm-hmm. Like, and even then it wasn't a part of their world because they didn't have slaves. Yeah. And, and um, true, it's true that Hamilton didn't actually own any slaves, but that doesn't mean he was an abolitionist. It doesn't. Um, and uh, one thing about this that I, that I will say that I appreciate, you know, at least Lin-Manuel Miranda didn't take it so far and try to pretend that Jefferson wasn't pl- pro-slavery. <laughs> at least he didn't do that, because I think people would have called bullshit on that. But to pretend that Hamilton was, was um, not, that was that Ham- Hamilton had a little bit of abolition in, l- abolitionist in him, to pretend that uh, Washington had regrets about slavery, like, these things are just not true. They're yeah. not true. He also spent the majority of his life in New York City where mm-hmm. slavery was not as popularized. It existed, yeah. certainly, and there are households that had slaves, but not anywhere near the extent of what you get in Virginia and lower, in the farm, in the farming countries where slavery was an economic resource. Mm-hmm. It, it, that didn't, people, people in the Caribbean and slavers did not advertise to people in New York because it wasn't necessary. It, was, it just wasn't a big necessary. part of the economy. It wasn't a big yeah. part of the economy in New York. It wasn't a big part of the economy. And because it, it also was not like in fashion in New York during mm-hmm. that time. Like it never, in the Eastern part of the United States, it never was a in fashionable thing in the way that it was in the South. Mm-hmm. It absolutely existed. Uh, one caused and the other, but, and then just because people didn't engage with it in this, in the North did not mean that they were fighting it. Mm-hmm. But that is something that like, I am a hundred percent convinced that if, if Hamilton lived in the South and he thought it would help his social status, he probably would have had slaves. Yeah, I mean, if he could get social status and money from it, he would have done it. It just wasn't the best way to do that in New York. Nope. And that's yeah, and that yeah. was like what stopped him. Or at least, right. obviously, this is all spe- speculating. But again, he like Karen said, he wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote so much stuff. We would have known if he was if he was an abolitionist. Yeah, we would have. We would have. I mean, you would you would learn about him in history books as the first abolitionist. You would. Oh my gosh! Thank you so much for the lurk to clarify. So happy to see you here. Um, been loving that you're playing Final Fantasy X too. By the way, um, so yes, uh, all of the founding fathers were pl- pro slavery. This idea that some of the founding fathers were abolitionist is simply not true if any of them were they kept real quiet about it you know and i don't care what people felt in their hearts i care what they did so they were not can we we talk about the one that makes me the fucking angriest because that also transfers us to the next slide yes which is fucking george washington there's this whole idea of uh, and then this is not necessarily written in text but it is written in acting um and and written in notes and stuff like that from lynn Morenwell. and it's this whole idea that at the end you know eliza does this whole thing where she writes against slavery where she does become a kind of abolitionist although it was very not really but she does make her thoughts known on the idea. She had a toe in it. She had like um, a tiny little toe she, in it. <laughs> and for a woman who had no, and for a woman who had no political background and was literally the wife of, of someone who was, very impressive, Eliza. Um, but there's this whole idea of like, George Washington looks at Eliza in this moment in time. And this is written in the notes of the script and mournfully looks at her because he knows that he did not accomplish the goal of freeing slaves from this country i'm fucking sorry but george washington had slaves <laughs> he never wanted to abolish slavery and it was literally written into the notes that he did and it was like no he did this is, no and and it's because we in 2012 know that slavery was a terrible horrific thing Um, And it is a thing that still exists in this world, but especially within our United States system, it was built into our into our government at that time in order for our government to succeed. Mm -hmm. And it still is. Um, Yeah. So I want to say this really quick. Yeah. We guess what, guys, Um, if you didn't know, we still have slavery. We did not (laughs) abolish it for prisoners. If you are convicted of a crime and go to prison, guess what? They can put you in slavery. Um, and we do that today. So we have not abolished fla- slavery in this country. We have severely reduced it. Thank God we don't have chattel slavery anymore um, based on strict racial lines, but it still exists. No, and our slavery and 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 the way slavery exists now is disgusting. 
Um, it is. But, you know, do you, do you hear any politician interested in, in ending the slavery of our prison population? Absolutely not. You do not. No. No. Um, <laughs> because corruption. Anyway, um, no. So it's obviously built into our system. Our system could not exist without it. It certainly couldn't have existed without it then, which is why it took 150 to 200 more years to abolish it on the mainstream idea of slavery. Uh <laughs> and why it, it continues to exist now. Um, but this idea that George Washington was secretly an abolitionist <sighs> grinds my gears so much. Yeah. And what it does is it really highlights in this play because we know it's a bad thing that all the people we are supposed to dislike in this play, specifically one, are pro-slavery. And all the people that we are supposed to like are anti-slavery, of some degree. And George Washington is the biggest example of that. That the, this idea of redemption of, of being anti-slavery, anti any man who had and owned slaves mm -hmm. uh, and never freed them and had no intention of ever freeing them. True. Uh, and that like that change just pisses me off. That's like one of the things that I'm just like, I understand it was for the character. I understand that it's a really easy way to manipulate audiences. And that was the purpose of it. And it makes sense because it does make us love George Washington and it makes those moments amazing, but it is those moments that are completely false yeah, to, yeah. to the, to the actual history of everything. Mm -hmm. Totally false. Although George um, Washington is quite the strong presence in this play. <laughs> he is the father. Uh, we love to recognize, we love to recognize um, thematic sort of tropes that exist. George Washington takes place as the father, not only as Alexander's father, but the father is in like, uh, like God into a religious sense. Mm -hmm. um, he is almost biblical in this play. And, and you see that because a lot of his music is choir music. Yeah. It's it has that deeper Southern sort of church music especially one last time is sung like a church choir um and and that is to give us this holy version of george washington that we're supposed to love yeah we're supposed to we're supposed to love the amount of gravitas he has not be scared by oh, it gosh sorry that keeps popping up yeah um and it's amazing writing but completely inaccurate <laughs> yeah totally inaccurate totally inaccurate so that's that's george's character in this well story. also and also like yeah he's this prolific he's supposed to be this prolific like leader in oh in yeah, battle. yeah and he sucks he's, he was never good in battle he killed and slaughtered thousands of his own men uh because he made a mistake in the uh in the not the war of 1812 the french is that the french indian war whatever i think, so. I think you're talking about french, the french indian, indian war, war that that happened before the revolutionary war he mm -hmm. he as a result of his um, inexperience, he, he thousands of people got slaughtered. He was like basically the only person who made it out alive <laughs> of his team. Yeah. Uh, and then he comes to lead the Revolutionary War and he's not good at it. Yeah, like like most young commanders, um, he makes a lot of mistakes in the beginning. A lot of mistakes in the beginning. And um, I mean, and he eventually gets gets better and uh, and gets good at it, you know. But a large reason why we we won the Revolutionary War is because England told George, we're dumping too much money into this and we don't care anymore. Not because we did good at fighting the British. <laughs> and that's just the truth. <laughs> so that's George Washington. Another yeah. rewritten historic character is Thomas Jefferson. Mm -hmm. uh, he is written as the only antagonist in this. Like if you're going to go traditional plot devices in a story he's written as the the antagonist um and you know he comes in half literally at, right after intermission basically saying what have i missed i've been high in france this whole time doing nothing and now i'm gonna argue every step of the way and it's supposed to be the person who hamilton hates he ends up blackmailing hamilton which is not really true. He ends no, up no, but like, the fact that he was getting high in France and then came back and and proceeded to be super annoying—that part is true. <laughs> that, I mean, yes, and also Thomas Jefferson sucks in general. Uh, but it, it's just very interesting how he was painted as the villain that we that even like 
he is as brilliant as Hamilton was in some degrees of oh, political yeah. as of political procedures of how to navigate social situations of understanding complex systems um and yet he is painted almost like a fool against Hamilton in a lot of ways where Hamilton is always showing him up so he is painted as this antagonist and it's just fascinating because because while we highlight all of Hamilton's successes to a degree that we forget the historical like the actual history of it we don't highlight any of Jefferson's but also don't hold him to any of his historical faults as well well I mean there's like this tiny tiny nod right where in in the song where he first comes on stage and he's like you know basically like Sally read the letter for me or open open it um and it's like Sally oh that's Sally that's Sally okay (laughs) okay so at least we acknowledge that one of the founding fathers was garbage when it came to slavery at least at least we're not pretending like Jefferson was some kind of abolitionist (laughs) but again he is the villain yeah so him being okay with slavery and also in like the cabinet battle number one wanting to keep slavery like and that is like the the whole point of the song is him trying to keep slavery and Hamilton trying to get rid of it um it, he's the only person supporting it and that shows him the villain and it's mm-hmm. like yeah I mean that's true he was very pro-slavery uh but also at the same time no one was fighting that against him yeah I mean he was just like I mean he was just the most pro-slavery it's not that the other ones weren't right yes, exactly. you know and of course he was because he had direct skin in the game like yeah, he, he, he Mon- ran Monticello. a plantation <laughs> yes so so no, that was- i will say this about jefferson though i absolutely love um this actor uh i love jefferson and i love um him playing lafayette and um this is just another shining example of the amazing talent on display um, um he's lafayette. fabulous <laughs> we're gonna talk about lafayette in a bit uh because yep. he has some amazing facts but yeah. yes no um oh my god david diggs is so good really but i just and I, um, I love how he how he makes jefferson like this this weird crazy flamboyant character um even though it's not of course nothing like jefferson was in real life but um that's an artistic choice i can stand behind i'm i'm I for it i like it, love it. it's so good <laughs> And then shall we go to my favorite, my baby, yes. if you okay. would, uh, Aaron Burr, mm-hmm. the villain. So there is a difference between an antagonist and a villain. Um, and it's just very interesting that Aaron Burr, Burr is the narrator of this story. From He is the first voice we hear and the last voice we hear. Uh, he tells Hamilton's story the entire time. Uh, he continues to like insert himself in this, but he is the villain of our story. Um, and uh, it's very interesting because Burr also didn't fucking matter that much in the grand scheme of United States history. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this whole idea that that Burr and Hamilton had this kind of like interwoven, um, you know, uh, interwoven lives together where they kind of weaved in and out of each other. That is mostly an invention of the play. A few of yes. the things that they say are true. Of course, Burr was the one that shot Hamilton. That is true. Um, they practiced law around the same time. That is true. But the rest of it, probably not. Probably not. They didn't have a long, torrid affair of friendship no. and betrayal and yeah Hamilton wouldn't have felt betrayed by Burr he wouldn't he wouldn't have felt betrayed by Burr he was just the same kind of political rival that he had uh, in in a lot of areas yeah and also like the reason and spurring of Burr dueling Hamilton wasn't because Hamilton simply said vote for Jefferson it was because he dragged Burr's name through the mat like through the mud he like was not kind to Burr when he was saying vote for Jefferson (laughs) Yeah, uh, and was that, like, vote for Jefferson because that Burr guy sucks. Yeah, it was the insult more than the hurt feelings yeah. uh, that really caused Burr to then sit there and say, "You want to fight, bro? Let's go. Let's go over." Yeah. To and I mean, we've had that. You've all you've all been in in workplaces before, I'm sure, yeah. where you've got like that other person that's maybe in a department adjacent to yours or part of your same department that just like won't leave you the fuck alone, like. Yep. That's kind of like what it was. And you don't need to have this like lifelong rivalry with that person to want to shoot them. Like, 
you, I mean, we've all felt it, okay? Let's be real. Well, it's all been anger. And back then, instead of talking about their feelings or using you direct communication, you dueled. Yeah. You did the thing, you fucking dueled. Yeah, you didn't call um, HR, you dueled. You dueled. There was an HR. That was what you did. That was step two. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Many steps in the dueling system to stop that, but step two was call the duel. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's just an interesting, it's, it's, the entirety of Burr's character is created for this play. Yeah. Um, we don't, because he is so uh, a man of waiting and waiting to see what political side, he was never really of any political importance. He was very likable, um, but that's because he was a likable guy who had money and had a daughter and, and was able to do all of that. It wasn't because he was a mastermind. So his political career was never really renowned or known um, beyond him running for president against Thomas Jefferson, who frankly was going to win no matter what and would have won whether Hamilton sided with him or not. Probably. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, but Burr was kind of like, you know, when when, uh, when Hamilton's kind of, you know, teasing him a little bit, and he's like, I'm going to have to listen to you. And he's like, talk less smile more Mm -hmm. like that's who that is who Burr was and that's why people liked him he was just he was a nicer guy than most of them and that's also why we don't know much about him which is why and uh, Lin-Manuel Miranda could have taken him and took his character where he did even though none of it is based off of his other than like shooting Hamilton is based off of much historical fact not really um, and unfortunately, yeah, and unfortunately, Burr was not nearly as prolific as Hamilton, so we can't like tell you what he was doing instead as easily. But um, but we can tell you there's no proof that he was doing the things in you know in this play. He was raising his daughter as a single father. <laughs> um, apparently, apparently, Lady has a lot to say about Aaron Burr. She won't leave me alone. What? Lady, lady what would like, you like to tell them? Do? What would you like um, to tell them about Burr? You know what? I think this is a great. A great time for an intermission now that Lady's here with us. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Unless there's more about Burr you wanted to say. No, no, we're good. And thank you so much for the lurk, Lunar. Thank you so much for the lurk. Yes, um, let's have a small intermission. Intermission. All right. Uh, this intermission is brought to you by our <laughs> our sponsor. Audible. Audible. <laughs> did you like the Did you like the ad voice I just put on there? I heard yes. It like- like, oh. Yes. Thank, so thank you so much, Audible, um, for continuing to sponsor Interstage Window. You can get your 30-day free trial at Audible using the link that I just popped into the chat, audibletrial.com slash interstage window. Um, if you are interested in uh, in learning a little bit more about our founding fathers, I do know that they have some ver- some things on Audible about them. Um, do we have a specific book recommendation, though, Landon? I don't have anything about our founding fathers, but if you like historical fiction, I have something for you. Oh, I do. So do you like historical fiction? Do you like gay lovers? Do you love Greek mythology as much as I do? Uh, There is an amazing book on Audible available called The Song of Achilles by uh, Madeline Meyer. And let me tell you about this book. (laughs) So good. Uh, it is the story of Achilles and his lover, per- Perlithius, uh, that is originally from actually the um, Iliad and the Odyssey. Uh, but it is their story during the, uh, oh my gosh, what are those wars called? The wars the of Trojan Asia. Wars. The Trojan Wars. Thank you. Which, you know what? Is this actually historical fiction? We don't know. It's a complicated thing, old Greek history. Uh, but it is very, very well written and a very good, and it tells the story of two lovers as they uh, battle through tragedy and war together. Mm-hmm. Young, young friends who fall in love. And this is the uh, kind of historical fiction that that's a little bit more my speed because I don't have specific buy-in to um, the, the state yeah. of ancient <laughs> Greece as a nation. So, um, you know, I don't have complicated feelings about reading about Achilles. <laughs> what? You did read about Achilles? Yeah, you'd have complicated feelings. You'd be like, man, that guy's kind of an asshole. Mm. Maybe I can change him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that is, again, the song of Achilles. It's fantastic. It's been around for a couple of years. It's blown up on Book Talk, but it's fantastic. So, mm-hmm. All right. Would- so if you guys would like to support the show, please um, sign up for your Audible free trial 
at slash inner stage window. My understanding is you only have to do those free 30 days and you can cancel it and you're still supporting us the way I understand it anyway. So um, take okay. that with a little grain of salt, but uh, but that's how I understand the contract to work. All righty, shall we move on? Yep, let's get back to it. We're gonna shift gears a little bit here, guys. Um, so we've done we've done a lot of, um, you know, uh, spitting some facts uh, laying down some truths. So, but we want to get into next the concept of truth. So Landon, what's your opinion in general? And then we'll talk about Hamilton. Do artists have an obligation to tell the truth? It's so complicated. Mm -hmm. Um, the artist in me says, no, you are telling, if you are a storyteller, your number one thing that you need to do is tell a story and the the way you tell your story the how you tell your story um that that shouldn't be part of your process of creating art uh the truth shouldn't be taken into consideration during that i do think however there is a there's a morality attached to it in some odd ways that if you are going to write things that is going to affect or negatively impact or have negative impact in general, um, that you need to be held somewhat accountable to that um, or at least the very least acknowledge it. Um, and, and where that line is, I have no idea. I think mm -hmm. it is incredibly, incredibly unexplored idea because you don't want to have to force authors to stay in the socially acceptable truth box because that that denies creativity um but at the same time if if someone is spreading hate or a negative or a negative movement or something like that there there is accountability that needs to be held yeah so, I mean, it's it's hard. I do think it's hard because I'm trying to imagine myself in the situation where I've written something that I believe is a is a fun story and not intended to be taken as truth. Um, and then what if it's taken as truth by people that I don't necessarily ideologically align with? Yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean. So I imagine yeah. things like how the alt-right very heavily used Pepe the Frog memes and how the creator of Pepe was so distraught by that and so upset. And, you know, I think like, well, it's not his fault that the alt-right took his art. Um, but I do think he did right by constantly <laughs> talking about how this is not right and not what his intention with Pepe was and how he was not associated with them and disagreed with them. And um, and I guess I can mention just a little bit about how I feel in regards to Lin Manuel Miranda with Hamilton. I I don't blame Lin Manuel Miranda for what ended up happening, for how his play was marketed, and for how people ended up taking it. But he's on Disney's payroll now, and and you know rolling in it for a reason because he also never stood up and said in a serious manner that if you think Hamilton was somehow against slavery, you're crazy, you know? And he, sh I do think he should be saying that. But whenever he's asked about these sorts of things in interviews, he's very joking and, and calm and chill, which is nice. Like, he seems like a nice guy, and I would love to be friends with him. But um, he doesn't really seem too concerned about some of the conclusions people draw from his play. I... <sighs> And I don't think he's responsible for those conclusions. I think that he has been very upfront and honest that he has written a work of fiction. Yeah. Like that's, yeah. that's he doesn't a, pretend like it's true. He doesn't <laughs> pretend that it's true. And in fact, he corrects people quite a bit about it. Um, but there's like there is also a sense, I feel, of being protective like because this is different right than the alt-right using something that is created which is heavily not aligned with your beliefs yeah this yeah. is the misinformation of history mm -hmm. which is as disastrous and dangerous absolutely but not nearly as like directly impacting harm it's not as obvious it's not as obvious 
Um, so, so there's also this level of like, he is disputing, he is holding the accountability of this is a work of fiction. I have changed things and created a character and I liked the story, not the people. So I wrote the story in a way that I liked it, um, that, that I think he, he can be jokey about it, that he doesn't have to take it seriously, that the impact that it has, he has created something that has inspired and positively impacted several, several different areas, whether it be getting people into history, whether it be getting people into understanding the, the war and possibly discovering more from themselves, um, creating an entire, like another, because he already had one, but another play that is a majority of people of color have to be cast in these roles in an extremely popular, like in an extremely popular play that is now available full time in three cities and a touring company plus internationally. Um, like there is a lot of positive impact that has come from that. And focusing on the negative harm, I think is a lot harder. Uh, when you've worked and put your blood, sweat and tears in something. Yeah, no. And I think that's, that's all good points. I know I wouldn't know anything about Hamilton other than he was shot. Um, if I'd never seen this play, because this is, I mean, this was kind of what, what triggered me into disliking Hamilton. You know, it came out, I like musical theater. So I listened to it and I was like, these songs are pretty good. And then I just saw it getting more and more popular. And I was like, and I saw some of the takes that people had. And I was like, wait a freaking second people think this is real <laughs> and like and it, and it started to upset me so much that i was like because i never thought it was real but i didn't know what was was not real um hang on ladies on top of the computer you cannot turn yeah. off that do not step on the power oh my god <laughs> oh my god okay i gotta get my notes back up so um so while i'm while i'm doing that uh landon keep keep going with whatever we were talking about Yes, so we were just talking about whether um, Lin Manuel Miranda is culpable for what he is, for what is happening, um, and I think that I think who is the most responsible and who has the most like reason to to actually be like held accountable is the marketing team mm. in all of this. Because the reality is, is that Lin-Manuel Miranda has written a story and a musical that is, that is positive impact and is entertaining and is good and is vivacious and has created this thing. And the marketing team then marketed it as fact. Yep. It was them who sat there and said, bring your history, students. Watch this. You don't even have to teach class. This is everything about the Revolutionary War. Uh, this is everything you ever need to know about Alexander Hamilton and the politics of, nine, of 1776. They are the ones who called it a history musical. It is the people who marketed it as a fact rather than fiction. And then from there, it tumbleweeded. Mm -hmm. It tumbleweeded into news outlets calling it fact, not fiction. It tumbleweeded to people who don't know. Like the reality is, is that like history is one of our weakest subjects as a, like as a society, uh, you know, there's no standardized teaching or requirements on, on studying history, whether it be American history or world history. There's no common core fact. Um, there, there's no standardized testing. There is standardized testing in every other single subject, but not history, which means that automatically history kind of gets this, like, whatever. In order to graduate in most states, you only have to take a government class. Um, it's, it's this really kind of messed up thing that we don't know about our own history. And so therefore people don't know automatically what's wrong with it. I didn't know what was wrong with it. You didn't know what's wrong with it. And we're two very intelligent women who go and research things that we learn about, but we are not the normal person who does that. No. Normal people just consume things and then think that they're fact. Yeah, um, I mean, I knew it smelled off. Like when I yeah. first listened to it, I was like, this is obviously fiction. You know, there's no such thing as a founding father of the people, you know, but like, <laughs> That's all I knew. I didn't know any details. But people don't even know that sometimes. And mm -hmm. and 
And the thing about the thing that we consume is that we don't want to have to question it. Yeah. Um, so much, like, like even the idea of reality TV is fictionized. And so many people don't understand that or know that. Like the things in the, the media and, and things that we are consuming, we don't really know if it's real or not anymore. Yeah. Um, and people don't even want to have to question it. They just want to shut it off. Uh, so really, I think who is at fault or has the most responsibility for truth telling is the is the people who are marketing it rather than the than the like than the artist. Mm-hmm. Or if mm-hmm. we're going to take this in terms of a book, it is the editor's responsibility to point out things within the text that might be problematic or wrong or anything like that. Yeah, and, and yep. then the and then it's the artist's responsibility to to fix it if they want to. Yeah. Um, but during the creation and the building process, I don't think it's the artist who has to sit there and, and, and try to tell the truth. Yeah, no, I mean, I can basically agree with that. I just I just find it interesting that uh, Lin-Manuel Miranda doesn't seem super interested in, um, in correcting the record, except in the details. Like he doesn't seem super interested in correcting the record on these overall things that really bother me. Um, and, and it's interesting that he, that he seems that way and also is, um, you know, basically on Disney's payroll at this point, like those, those two things are, are both happening and I cannot help but feel like they are somehow related. You know what I mean? Like if Hamilton hadn't been successful as it was and Lin-Manuel Miranda hadn't decided this is my shot and I'm going to take my shot. And, uh, you know, if, if, if those two things hadn't happened, what would he say? Because he's very forthcoming about certain details being true or not true. Oh, yeah I and I think also at the end of the day like I I can't and won't judge an artist for selling out or for you know making sure that they're fed or for getting the credit that they'll get Disney he's a hundred percent in Disney's pocket but you know what I would be in Disney so I'm not gonna sit here and be like if Disney didn't wasn't willing to pay me all the money to write good stories, I would also be in Disney's pocket. <laughs> it is hard. It is hard to say that because it's like, you know, if you're given that opportunity, would you not take it? Like, no, I want the money. And you know, I, w- I want the money too. I want to be comfortable. And I think that that is any, any person in general, but I also think that that is a very common thing among artists where, I mean, he was not from a rich family. He worked and worked and worked. And yes, he he hit it big pretty young, but he still had a he still had a family to take care of. Yeah. And he still has a job. And as an artist, you don't have consistent income. And when you are writing a musical, you are spending years and years and years spending money and not getting money. And he's done it twice. <laughs> so it's I get it. I understand it to an aspect. Um can confirm what sell out. <laughs> Would. Yeah. I, I never <laughs> listen. There is a reason that is a snake. That I am a Slytherin. <laughs> Give me the opportunity. I'd fucking take it. Um, and I get that. I get that. Uh, yeah, we all have I, to eat. We all have to eat and we all have to pay a mortgage. I'm I am. I think it would be a very different story if he had refused to ever admit the things that he changed. Mm-hmm. Unless he was like directly like been like, well, Alexander Hamilton didn't do this thing. Um, I think then like if he held it in until he was confronted with this stuff, it'd be a very different story. But since from the very beginning, he's like, yeah, no, Hamilton, Hamilton is not a good guy. <laughs> uh, people didn't like him, but he has a really cool story. Uh, I think that that makes it a little bit different. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's easy to be sympathetic towards him. It's easy to be sympathetic towards towards Lin Manuel Miranda here. So I just, but I just don't want anybody to forget um, the factors at play, <laughs> as it were. But also, he's incredibly fucking talented. <laughs> oh my god, a lyrical genius. Okay, so so we, let's actually talk. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about this the story. I was like Karen. I understand that there's a lot of problems with this play, but can I please have time to just talk about <laughs> how? amazing this play is uh how how masterful work of art this is so uh first and foremost the fucking story um and I, it tells the story the thing about hamilton is that it tells the story of two young men as they come of age 
and have children themselves all the way to the end, to basically the end of their lives and the decisions that they make that haunt them throughout all of that. Um, so the story is of Alexander Hamilton, who is a righteous, go-getter, hungry, young, scrappy, and hungry, just like his country. <laughs> Rolling my <laughs> Well, eyes. he is. His country is not, but he is. <laughs> his country is not. No, but got to say that lyric. Mm -hmm. uh, young, scrappy, and hungry sort of go-getter. And Alexander, and with nothing to lose and only the world to gain and the determination that it will be his to gain. And Aaron Burr, who is quiet and reserved and willing to wait for things to happen and uh, has lost everything and still has so much more to lose, knowing how much more there is that he still has in his hands and can't control, he can't control it slipping from him. Mm -hmm. um, and these two men who have, who are basically the same person in some aspects, but dealing with the situations very differently, come together, meet and weave in and out of each other's lives and continuously take direct stances against each other. Uh, you know, Hamilton is handed what feels like he's handed Washington's position while Burr asks for it. They both become lawyers and Hamilton is gaining and gaining and nonstop writing while his Burr has to make sacrifices for his family because Hamilton got the girl and Burr didn't. And yeah. it's like this idea of weaving inside of that, each other's lives until at the very end they have... And then they meet in the middle. Sorry, let me go here first. They meet in the middle of the room where it happens, where Hamilton basically says, you know what, Burr, I got to be more like you. I got to talk less and smile more. And Burr sits there and goes, I'm so sick of being outside the door. I have to be more like Hamilton. I have to be hungry and not let anybody get in my way. So I'm going to defeat everybody who's in my way. Uh, and they finally collide at the very end with being two men who are now opposite of who they started with Hamilton throwing away his shot, doing the thing he never said he would do, putting his gun into the air and throwing away his shot and Aaron Burr taking his shot, not waiting to see what Hamilton will do. And ultimately that ends up killing him and ruining both of them. And that's just like the story, <laughs> the masterful storytelling it's really beautiful. It's really beautiful. When I hear you describe it like that, it just makes me like, God, I wish this was the truth. <laughs> Absolutely. But you know what? It's not. And if you can separate it and if you can sit there and I know that you can't and it's fine. And maybe if it wasn't about the founding fathers, I could. But if, because it's about the founding fathers and I have the feelings I have about our country. Yes. You know, you can't. but it's just give me this story in ancient Egypt or something, you know, <laughs> this story of like just two men and the way that they interact throughout their whole life. And the idea that this is like Burr basically at the end sits there and goes, I have just told you the story of this hero, but I am the villain because of the actions I have made. Um, and so we will both fade from this world and not be able to give everything we gave. It is just so, I love it so much. And it's such a beautiful story that I feel like I want, yeah, I, I love this story. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have no words other than to say that this is the perfect story in my head. Um, don't get me wrong. I hate Hamilton. <laughs> Love Burr. <laughs> but uh, especially some actions in the story. But I think that there's two men who grew too proud. Uh, and ultimately, turns out the woman was the hero all along. Uh, <laughs> well, is... there's only there's only three characters where they they are featured so heavily in both Act One and Act Two that the actor doesn't get to play multiple characters, and that is Hamilton, um, Burr, and Eliza. Everybody and Washington and Washington. Um, but uh, but most of the characters, you know, most of the actors switch characters when it comes to the different acts. Um, because their original, their character in Act One just barely appears in Act Two, or not doesn't appear at all. Yeah, and um, and I think there's also like a beautiful story there too. If you go back and forth, you have those five main actors or six main actors because you also have Angelica, mm -hmm. and so you got like wait for it in for Burr. You have wait for it in the beginning, which is a song about him waiting for it, and then Room Where It Happens, which is his main solo in the second act, 
and they're opposites of each other. Yeah. You have satisfied uh, for Angelica, which is about longing for Alexander and giving up that sacrifice. And then you have uh, It's Quiet Uptown, which is, which is Angelica singing about the sacrifices that they've had to make as parents and watching that destroy them. Mm-hmm. Um, and you, you also have like, you know, burn versus helpless in, in Eliza's case. And it's like this idea of these six main characters that did not change have the opposite in the second act. Mm-hmm. Um, and the characters that did change play a very similar role in Alexander's life. So they don't change. They play the second thing out, whereas Lafayette was constantly challenging Hamilton. So is, so is uh, Jefferson. Mm-hmm. Whereas Mulligan was like that backup bro. He's also that backup bro for Jefferson uh, mm-hmm. and when he plays <laughs> Adams. Uh, and, and Peggy is like the tag along sister. And then all of a sudden shows up as Mariah. And it's like, mm-hmm. it's just this interesting just a position of of seeing how the stories change for everybody it's very satisfying it's very satisfying <laughs> very satisfying. <laughs> thank you so much for that applause jane as you know now landon can live another week <laughs> i needed it after this one <laughs> just talking about hamilton um is there anything sorry i've been talking no about- you no, know, the story, story the story of hamilton is good the only thing i can really say is just i wish this were the real story I wish it was. And then I wouldn't have to feel the way I feel. Feel that. Yeah. 100% feel that. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Awesome. Then let's talk about the music. Okay. So Uh, as much as I didn't like Hamilton in the beginning and my hatred for it only grew and the loathing grew, it doesn't change the fact that these songs have not left my brain since 2012. Um, Lin-Manuel Miranda writes some earwigs, absolute earwigs. Um, uh, if you don't believe it, but you don't have three hours to watch, uh, to watch Hamilton, go listen to We Don't Talk About Bruno, uh, or Surface Pressure from Encanto. Uh, it never, it never leaves. It never leaves. Forever. It's in there forever. Um, so yeah, uh, I think that there's a really important aspect of this is that yes, this is revolutionary in the musical theater aspect that it was a first mainstream um, mainstream play to incorporate rap, hip hop, R and B, and opera style writing all in one. Yeah, um, they're obviously playing with different musicality and music genre in Broadway has been around for a while. See Rent as a rock musical. Um, all American Idiot, you know, mm-hmm. Mamma Mia, all of these kinds of things play off of this. But this is the first time that like rap and hip hop have been involved. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. And it's so cool because Lin Manuel Miranda really does play homage to so many different influential, famous artists uh, in that side of the community, whether it be like um, Biggie, P- Tupac. Uh, oh my gosh jay-z um there's some eminem in there uh and then again we talked about gospel music for washington uh we talk about r&b and alicia keys for the schuyler sisters destiny child for the schuyler sisters like there's so much influence. you can so hear destiny's child and the schuyler sisters destiny so child much. yes <laughs> so, and so much. much and and you know something i didn't realize until the disney plus version came out was that this was an opera. Like I fully expected when the Disney Plus version came out that I would watch it and I would there would be like speaking parts and I would hear additional context to the songs. And then I was like, oh, oh, it's an opera. Oh. The only, <laughs> the only two songs or the only two parts that are left out of the um of the whole album is uh the song. <sighs> Um, where he finds out Lawrence has died mm-hmm. and Eliza's scream when Philip dies. Yeah. Uh, which is again, mirroring each other because it's the same actor that dies. Those are the only two things that are left off of the entire album. So it is completely operatic. You get the whole story listening to it. Although I think so much of the story comes with the choreography uh, and the stage design, but yes, this is, it's so cool. And it's what it really does is I think it also turns the story to be so quick, you could never linger on one part of the story. That's true. So much happens. Like, this is not like 
the musical Rent, which takes place over the course of one year. This is not like, you know, um, the musical Phantom of the Opera, which is like three days. This is the entire life of Alexander Hamilton. So you have a whole 30 years to tell. Um, and it has to go fast because so much happens. Yeah, and it, it blows my mind how much they fit in. Like, and how much is not cut from what happens. Um, by the way, the troublemaker's back, so I don't know how long I'm going to let her stay in the room since she I literally turned off the computer, but, but we're going to see how this goes. <laughs> You're very cute, Lady Boots. you got to calm down. Oh, troublemaker. Um, <laughs> so, so, yeah, I just, I just think, like, this particular musical is the fastest i think in existence the magic number is 144 uh which is the amount of words per minute in this musical yep and this this is one of the faster parts you know lafayette uh, yes this. this is this oh, is, so or 100, sorry so it's 144 um it's 144 for this song i yeah. apologize it's a hundred and it's 130 for the average, average. Of the entire people. to compare phantom of the opera is down in the 70s yeah and that's and it's very rare for a musical's words per minute to be over 100 very very rare no, it doesn't happen yeah <laughs> um, that's just not how they're set up that's not how they're set up that's not typically how the songs are set up but well, they've got so many fast songs in this uh-uh you're getting kicked out again sorry guys one second so many fast fast songs um fast lyrics that it's impossible to almost get the story if you've not if you've not watched it like more or listened to it more than once like you get the whole meaning and the whole like idea of the story but man you do not get like the intricacies until you've listened to it two three five seven times and even then I'm still I've listened to it so many times. I've watched it so many times. I'm still learning new things. Right. Um, and I like I talk about like the genius that I think of how they fit in everything in regards to like um, explaining Hamilton's financial plan and how he was able to compromise with the the Virginians mm-hmm. and, and putting the capital in D.C. And um, and that helped him get votes to push the financial plan through and all of these things like the way that they condense that down is really genius. But you have no idea the first time you're watching it like you it takes it takes several listens and viewings to figure out like, oh, wait, that's what that line means. Oh, that's what that line means. Oh, my God. Oh, they actually are covering this. It's in there. And even then you won't you don't. Get, like you don't really get the like because even then once you've got the story down it's then the writing that comes out and again this is again the the hip-hop and rap sort of uh rhyme scheme that not even mm-hmm. just rhyme screen but also bars that come in where it is like using words to meet multiple things in one line after another and then playing on words and that and everything like that so like a, a huge part of this Sorry, I clicked it a little early, but a huge part of this is like Hamilton is so smart and quick witted that Lynn Manuel Miranda writes almost every single line that he says in the entire play to rap, to rhyme, not only at the end of the sentence, but also the middle syllable of the middle word of the line. Like that's Which is crazy. why it's such why why he creates such earwigs. That's how he that's like the formula yes. right there of why like most of the songs that he writes will not leave your head once you've heard them. That's what makes them earwigs. And it's just it's just he's a genius. And without the influence of rap and hip hop, he would have never landed on his method of writing that he landed on, and we would not have the genius that we have. Like the the rap and the hip hop influence on Lin Manuel Miranda's lyric writing is absolutely essential to producing yeah. what he produces. And I think that this is also, it gives a, this changed how Broadway can look at the, like the bar of what is a good musical and what is good songwriting in musicals, because it Mm -hmm. has changed how musicals are produced, the level of, obviously Lin-Manuel Miranda is a masterpiece writer. Mm -hmm. Uh, No one is trying to write the next Hamilton or copy him exactly. But like the that level of of expectation of you can do this, you can push this limit and write a hit to rock to like get as close to detail as the idea of rap like that burr is so 
is so stagnant and careful with his words that he speaks in meter. And that's how he speaks and sings is in meter until he lets loose halfway through the show is like this crazy idea and expectation that that is lighting up like a fire under Broadway and all the artists involved. Mm -hmm. And it's what makes Hamilton also so rewatchable, you know, in a way that a lot of musicals aren't, you know, Um, you get more out of it every time you watch it. And when you have created something like that, I think you have created like real art. And Lin-Manuel Miranda is is so, you, you can sense it, everything that he's made, you can sense it. He is such a detail oriented person um that like you can tell every single little thing is incredibly purposeful um incredibly purposeful well thought through um it's just like you know i i aspire to be able to execute my creative visions as well as this man does and that's yeah oh my god one could wish and that's yeah this idea of the melodies that haunt people so it's things like um eliza has this line helpless that is, she sings to the song, she, she sings to this melody, and she also says this word throughout her entire arc up until in the second half when um, Hamilton cheats on her, he sings it to Mariah Reynolds. And that is the last time that we hear it sung in the entire thing because once Eliza finds out, she's no longer helpless. She's no longer under that, like, melody control of I can't I am helpless uh so like that haunts her we also have the ten dual commandments um throughout the entire thing so the ten dual commandments is uh, a melody that is based off of Biggie's uh ten crack commandments and uh it haunts throughout the entire play because we see the first duel with Burr and uh or not with Burr with Lawrence and cannot remember the other guy's name, but we see a duel there. And then we hear that melody again without realizing we hear it because we hear it on a piano of Philip singing it mm-hmm. in nonstop. And he's counting to seven in French and it's the same exact melody. And then he rhymes to it. And then the next time we see Philip is when he's a grown man and he's dueling. And then we hear it once more in the final piece when Lynn is talking, or not Lynn, when Hamilton is talking about Philip dying in a duel as he's about to duel Burr. And so like it haunts throughout the entire thing in a way that is very like reminiscent of fandom of the opera haunting that melody, but very new and different because it follows a character rather than following a situation. Yeah. Um, and that just- happens... And so, and that's and that's why like when you watch it the second time you you get even more out of it because you can't possibly pick up on all of these different things when you're when you're on the first time that you're listening to it and I know that's why it got so popular on places like Tumblr that rewatchability contributes to um to social media contributes to creating a fandom contributes to people wanting to engage um in 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 commenting and reblogging and things of that nature and so things that have rewatchability are going to um much more easily develop a fandom and that's why this musical developed the fandom in a way that other musicals do not yeah and just the there's also a tumblr and when when fandom is when fandom is taking control, especially Tumblr 2012 version, uh, it's really hard to separate yourself from like, or the, what you like from also feeling like you have to defend it and feel so overly passionate about it. Uh, well, it's, 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 because it was kids, it's kids on Tumblr. I mean, I don't know if it's really still a lot of kids on Tumblr, but because it's because it was teenagers and yeah. Child <laughs> in 2012. And I was on Tumblr, but no, it is. It is that mentality of, of something I love can't be critiqued because you're critiquing me. Uh, mm-hmm. And that's not, that's, that's part of why I think also people got really passionate about it because they came together and was like, we must defend this thing. Mm-hmm. Um, no, no. So that is the musical, uh, the music part of it. Um, <laughs> And of course you can enjoy the story and you can enjoy the musical just by listening to the album on like Spotify uh, because it is everything. Um, But then I think Karen, you were a little taken aback or surprised maybe when you saw the choreography. Yes. (laughs) So when I saw the choreography on the Disney plus version, um, I was like, 
Hot damn. I could not believe it. My mind was blown at how masterful it was. And this is really one of the things that kind of like cements Lin-Manuel Miranda as a, as a genius artist, even though I do not agree with what ended up happening to his musical and the fact that it was portrayed as fact. And there are elements of other Lin-Manuel Miranda works that I, I struggle with. Um, as you guys know, I had issues with um, the main character of Encanto. I thought she was pants. Um, but, uh, but, you know, there's other things that Lin-Manuel Miranda works on that, that I love, like his version, his rendition of, um, Tick, Tick, Boom, I think is absolute genius. Um, but most of it, he didn't change. Most of it was as original, but anyway. In the Heights is also very good. Yeah. In the Heights is also very good, but the play uh, version the movie, of it, yeah, the play version of it's way better. <laughs> yes. Even though, and the movie was, it had some, had some very much casting mistakes made in yeah. it. Um, as well as they the, cut some the songs I wish they hadn't. <laughs> but anyway. The in Hamilton, one of the things that just absolutely blew my mind was the choreography and how they use the set design. It is incredibly minimalist set, but there there is a particular element um, in the center of the stage where you've got a turntable. So they have a they have a circle in the center that that will rotate, and then they've got an additional circle around that that will also rotate. So I've got a screenshot here of Hurricane, which is towards the end. And it's like everyone is rotating around Hamilton and like he's in the eye of the hurricane, which is it's hearkening back into how he he came to New York in the first place, you know, because um, he was tra it was in a hurricane. And, and that's, you know, then he left the island after that. And um, and the way that they do it with how they make the characters kind of rotate around each other and how they use the turntables to make them draw further apart and closer together in certain um, scenes. And and they, they do this in such a way that's like, again, just like the music, you don't realize it the first time you watch it, but... There is so much in the rewatchability of this, like the amount of times that like Hamilton is rotated around the stage or like walks along the edge of the turntable in a circle versus Burr's like very straight lines across the stage and he barely uses the turntable. He just kind of like, you know, goes this way or, you know, very straight lines parallel or perpendicular to Hamilton but Hamilton's always going like, you know, around this way and around that way and letting the turntable take him and, you know, things like that that it just, I was just like, oh, this is genius. It's genius. Um, you know, Lin-Manuel Miranda is such a genius. Why did you have to make your breakout star thing about Hamilton, sir? I well, could love okay. you. First of all, I have to, have to m mention In the Heights won three Tonys before Hamilton was true. Even That's true, but it this wasn't like not popular. his breakout moment. This is the this is like the this is the stardom. This is what made him a celebrity. Yeah, this is what made him a celebrity. I mean, you're you're right. It's just that um, Hamilton was where I first really understood who he was, and then I went back and listened to In the Heights later, um, yeah. as most people did, I think, because I didn't know who the heck he was when it, when In the Heights was out. You know, I mean, I knew In the Heights was supposedly good, but I wasn't like, you know, I didn't know. Um, but, uh, but yeah, and, and it's the, the turntables, the turntables are genius. Um, it, of course, you know, is reminiscent of, uh, of hip hop and R&B. You use turntables in both of those genres of music. And, um, the fact that, uh, that a hurricane was one of the events that caused Hamilton to choose to move, um, and what sent him to New York to go to school instead of staying on the islands. So it's just like, I mean, it's thematically resonant um and genre resonant resonant in a way that is just so um so satisfying i also don't think we can mention the choreography without mentioning the winter's ball satisfied or winter's ball helpless satisfied trio uh which is so the, good which is the moment where where aaron burr and hamilton go to a winter's ball uh, Hamilton meets Angelica Schuyler. Angelica falls in love, introduces her to Eliza, and they get married. Like they meet, they Hamilton meets her father, and it's the whole love story. So mm -hmm. this this is taking place over over Winter's Ball and Helpless. The whole scene is played out, mm -hmm. and then you get to Angelica, and Angelica starts her song with Rewind, and for the first. 30 40 seconds the entire cast does the does the choreography that they just spent two songs doing backwards 
Yeah, they do like backwards yeah. turbo speed and they play the music backwards turbo speed. Yeah. And it's amazing. And the and the turntables are turning backwards and then everything is suddenly frozen. And so everyone is frozen in place. The turntable moves so that everything is about a quarter step different. So that instead of Eliza being the focus of this retelling, Angelica is the focus of this retelling. Mm-hmm. And through the seven minute song, they play the same exact choreography as they just did for the two previous dancers, but that half a step off so that it is, is so that it is Angelica telling the story, walking us through her meeting Hamilton, deciding to introduce him to Eliza, Eliza and Hamilton getting, you know, serious and writing letters and then introducing to his father and all the while Angelica is talking about this. And it's it, like the choreography, the fact that they were on stage, no one's left the stage. They've done the choreography, did it backwards, and now do it a half step different is insane. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's genius. It's beautiful how the turntables are used during that point, how like the turntables are used so that the choreography can be just that little bit off. And it's so cool. It's very so, cool. so fucking cool. It's very cool. I mean, there's a cool, there's no other way to describe it. It's just cool. It's so, it's genius. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's wonderful. And um, then there's one other thing about the set design that I, that I really, really loved in addition to the turntables and that's how they use the scaffolding. So in the, in the first act, they've got this scaffolding and it's kind of like very bare bones, which is, is really neat because Um, The country doesn't really exist yet. This is pre-revolutionary war. So it's kind of like very, very bare bones scaffolding. um, And it matches with the young, scrappy and hungry that we're supposed to think. So we can, you know, I think we've belabored it to death. Obviously, that wasn't the reality, but, you know, it matches. So it's thematically resonant. Um, And 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 you've got all these characters like on the scaffolding and then below the scaffolding watching. And it's very interesting to look in the background and see like who is in what positions during what songs when they're not really the one present on the stage. And this happens throughout. And it's it's just it's very intriguing. Yes, it it, it reminds us of the fact that history has our his eyes on its eyes on you, which is a song later in the play. Um, But then also the top of the scaffolding represents like in a certain way, heaven or mm-hmm. people looking down that have passed on. So, yeah. you like know, Washington's point, up there. Washington gets up there. Lawrence is up there watching for a little while. Philip, his son is up there watching for a little while. Uh, when Burr says that both his parents dies, there are two people who are up on the scaffolding just in the background watching as things happen. Um, and so the scaffolding is built very bare bones. And then we come back for the second half. And man, when they bring up the lights in that second half and you can see all the changes they've made to the scaffolding, I was like, a second what? A second story is built. So cool. So cool. And then like, <laughs> and then Jefferson comes out and then like he's, he's traveling from, from uh, France to back to America and the, the people get like, take the stairs and like move him. I was like, Oh, this is so good. And that's one of the few things, of course, you cannot get from just from listening to it. So I appreciate the Disney Plus version for existing because I was able to see that. It blew my mind. And I just remembered like high school theater because I did everything in in high school theater. You know, sometimes I was acting on the stage. Um, I was a stage director one time. Sometimes I was working behind the stage. I mean, I tried a little bit of everything. And just like, the talent of the the stage hands to go and and do that and set everything up during intermission i was just like i know what kind of work goes into that and my my mind was blown it was so good yeah um no was, and it's just and also like the costuming goes with that too is that in the very beginning it is very scarce costuming and then in the second half it's a little yeah. bit more and jefferson it's- comes out in this like purple like like amazing yes. pimp suit it's so um, cool. And even the background beige, like the the women who are in the background beige, they didn't have corsets on as much in the first half. And now they yeah. do. They're a little bit fancier and and all of that kind of stuff too. Uh, and it's it's so well done. Um, and then I wanted to talk about one more thing that I had forgotten until we were talking about this. And I was like, God, I have to talk about this for choreography. Uh, and that is the theory of the bullet. And mm-hmm. that the bullet mm-hmm. is a character and a dancer who represents death 
And so anytime a character dies or is going to be dead in the next song, the bullet interacts with them first. Uh, and she and she can be seen in the duels passing the bullet and playing the act of like the bullet moving across the stage. Uh, and that's just a really cool, beautiful choreography. And she's such a moment. good dancer. By the way, the girl that, that plays yes. the, the bullet oh, yes. is like, it's absolutely amazing dancer. Like her, mo- her movements are so fluid. Like it's yes. just, it's breathtaking. Watch her do these, um, these bullet dances. And I could, and we we're running out of time, so we got to go, but just know <laughs> that I could talk about the, the nuance and the, the detail of Hamilton, especially the lyrics and the poetry for hours. So if anyone ever wants to do that, let me know <laughs> and we can hang out and do that. Uh, but I could talk for hours. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Kitty, that dancer appears multiple times in relation to death yeah. and bullets. Um, so so, uh, so give it a one of the best examples is that Hamilton is almost shot in um, not Yorktown. I think it's guns and ships. Yeah. Uh, it's guns and fighting. ships. I'm pretty sure. And there is like the sound of a bullet and Hamilton is barely missed. It is the same woman. And she goes, that bullet. she, inter- she uh, plays one of the dead soldiers in- that are shot in the first half uh, that she is the person who is shot. She plays the bullet in all three duels. Um, and then she also touches, she's the one who leads Washington out um, of the play so that during one last time um, she's, she's anytime a character dies, she is right there with them. Mm-hmm. It's it's just and again, this isn't something that unless you were a super fan, you know about, uh, or stock or stock the tags or or have, or how are going to write a video essay about it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Until you have to watch this thing like three times to because yeah. you're about to talk about it for two hours. <laughs> it's that attention to detail that makes this musical magical. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It, it is again, it is that same thing as like rhyme scheme. It's that tiny detail that just makes it beautiful yeah so we have i think that this leaves us to the most important question Mm -hmm. of all of hamilton yeah which is what happened to peggy (laughs) (laughs) what the heck did happen to peggy okay so this was something i struggled with in um when i when i listened to it and then in the play it's in the when you see it it's even more obvious because it's like oh there's the actress again but Peggy just disappears they never even mention her there's like third sister who the fuck is that she doesn't come help whenever Hamilton cheats um you know she she doesn't what happened to Peggy so no the (laughs) most beautiful line I think in the first half is like the Skylar sisters Angelica Eliza and Peggy yeah Uh, and so and then we never see her after the second half because she's gonna play Mariah Reynolds um and fantastic amazing fucking singer but hey this is probably the question that Lynn Manuel Miranda gets the most the answer is Peggy married had two children and then died mm-hmm. and she just she really in in reality the Skylers had tons and tons of siblings tons of siblings and most of them really weren't around um you know uh, Eliza and uh and uh shoot the name just left my uh, Angelica <laughs> Eliza and Angelica were very very close and Lynn Manuel I mean um so I keep substituting the names. Hamilton did write back and forth a lot to Angelica, not romantically the way that it is in the play. Although, although historically, Angelica was the one who was writing romantically to Hamilton. Yeah, it, and so there's, but it's it's possible that it was just familial affection and that it wasn't yes. really romantic. Um, we don't know. Um, so, <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, it really, those two sisters were were close. They weren't close with all of their siblings because there was like fifteen of them. So yeah. Um, but that's what happened to Peggy. So we just yeah. had to throw that in there. <laughs> but um, here's our real question. Okay, so so question. the real question: Did it resonate? Okay, Landon, I'll let you go first. <laughs> yes. Uh, no. Okay. So as far as it did, it resonate. Um, I think on an art level, absolutely. Like this is the project that I hope I can build a fraction of one day. The attention to detail, the beautiful, the beautiful ability to write stories and characters that are charming and a, and make audiences love them. Uh, that are going to that are approached with such empathy and everything like that. I think that that does resonate um what doesn't resonate is everything outside of what the actual art is 
um, the way that it was marketed, uh, the way that it was blown up as this savior to people of color within the music industry, or not music industry, within the um, musical theater industry, uh, the way that, which we didn't even get to talk about very much, uh, the way that it is still talked about as a fact and not fiction, um, I think all of that doesn't resonate. Um, and therefore there is a little bit of this that is like, this music is beautiful. This work is beautiful, but I have to take everything with a grain of salt. Yeah. So I would say for me, did it resonate in 2012? Unfortunately, it resonated with a lot of people, unfortunately. Um, I think that for a lot of people, and I'm, and I know that during the first half of this, I sounded like an annoying SJW that just can't like things and doesn't want you to like things either, but that's never my intent. My intent is never to make you relook at something and lose your love for it. My intent is always to make you, to, through talking about pieces of media, to help you love it more. Um, and so if I did that for you, I apologize. But I do think that if you go rewatch it again in 2022, um, it doesn't resonate as much as it did. And it probably won't resonate as much as it did with you, um, except in maybe a nostalgic sense. I think if this musical came out now, it would receive a lot more criticism for its inaccuracies and um, and potentially, you know, not skyrocket Lin-Manuel Miranda to uh, fame the way that it did. Uh, it was it was very of its time. It was very of its time. And I think as we move forward, Hamilton will slowly become less and less relevant to musical theater. That's what I think will happen. Now, whether it will or not, I don't know. Um, I do... I, I do like some of the precedent that it set that you could have and all or almost all uh, POC musical. I think that's great that that's a thing that exists now and Hamilton was a case study that proved it could be. Um, the rest of it, I could take it or leave it. And uh, and uh, I just, I wish Lin-Manuel Miranda the best and, and better. And, um, and I, I hope that when he continues to write like that he won't go back to these sorts of things that are so easy for the machine of capitalism to take and to uh to to instead of elevating the art worry about how it can be used as propaganda because that's what happened so i think he's done writing about uh, I think he is too. I think he although is too. I think I think here is the deal uh Lin Manuel Miranda has never pretended to write anything less than the stories he relates to. Mm -hmm. And I think he related heavily to the story of Alexander Hamilton coming into a country, having to write, having to be misunderstood, having to having to scrounge and, and claw his way up. I think that that is a story that Lynn relates heavily to. Uh, same thing as Into the Heights. I think he relates to very quickly. So I, I don't think that there's probably another story uh, in American history <laughs> that will do that. Uh, but I have a feeling that there will be other stories like this one. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. It'll be interesting to see what is next uh, because everything that he has written as far as on the musical level of, of stage musical has had commentary on America and the way that it's run. So we'll see if that that is a theme that continues as well. Yep. So if you love, if you like Lin Manuel Miranda's um, projects, and you're you're you know more interested in some of his newer commentary, I would highly recommend watching Tick Tick Boom, which he did not write. It was written by the guy that wrote Rent. It was written before Rent, but it never took off. Like it never really grabbed people. However, I am here to tell you, it's better than Rent. And uh, and Lin Manuel Miranda took it and produced a movie version with Andrew Garfield that is absolutely excellent. Uh, and I know that uh, Karen did not particularly like the protagonist of Encanto, but it yeah. is an amazing children's story that in movie that does tell uh, a very important story on on generational trauma uh, and has catchy fucking music. So I'd also recommend that, too, because I think it's excellent. And also Moana. Moana is fantastic as well. Um, Moana's got a lot of good songs. And you know what? You could skip the In the Heights movie and just listen to the soundtrack. 
Yeah. <laughs> Just skip the movie. Uh, All right, you guys. Um, let's let's talk about where to find us. Lady really wants in again. I'm just gonna hold her. So while while I'm doing that, Landon, tell everybody where to find you. You can find me at on Instagram at Land in Maine. Look at my cute little kitten that's right there. Um, you can find me there. I am just you know doing my thing, living everyday life. Uh, and also I'm on Twitter, being sarcastic. You can see me. I'm on day 32 of my wor- Wordle score. Um, even though, you know, New York times has changed it for the worst. I'm still playing it. Cause you know, capitalism, uh, <laughs> I feel like it lost its soul when New York times purchased it a hundred percent. Uh, the day that they did ulcer and ultra two days in a row, I was like, this is stupid. Um, <laughs> but I'm still playing it cause I love a good, I love to do things that make me angry. Um, <laughs> so Can yeah. someone exclamation land in socials, please? So people have the links. I can't let this cat go or she'll turn off the computer again. Thank you. I she can't was driving everyone crazy, meowing outside the door. Um, Karen, where can they find you? Okay, you guys can find me right here on Twitch. You can also find me on YouTube. Um, we are next episode of Interstage Window going to be doing our community day. And um, it's going to be uh, Don't Starve Together. So we're going to go back to Spiderland. I got a mod that's going to fix that, fix everything for us so that um, we don't have to start over. Um, and then on Thursday, we're going to take a little bit of a break from our Nuzlocke, and we're going to be playing I Love You, Colonel Sanders, Blind. Um, we're doing this for Kendra. So, Kendra, if you're here, please, please uh, join. And thank you guys so much for contributing to uh, finishing Doki Doki Literature Club. Um, as soon as that is finished, we will be putting that on the schedule so we can actually play Act 3 of that particular game. So, yes, that's all the places that you can find me. Um, and yeah, follow me in, in all the places. Yes. And, um, I think that that's it. I'm sad that I will be missing, uh, so don't start together. So whoever is playing, don't start. <laughs> All right, guys. Okay, so what we are going to do for the end of this stream is we're going to go and raid into our friend Alpha Tiff, who is a supporter of the stream. Um, and uh, she is doing a 12 hour stream right now and she's currently playing dragon age inquisition so so we're gonna go raid into alpha tiff let me make sure i got her name right yes there we go all right guys thank you so much for joining us today as always of course uh for don't forget to make it a great day don't forget to be awesome all right bye guys see you later bye